If you will consult your schedule, you'll see that the lecture scheduled to be given now is a lecture in Employment Relations Remedies by Ian Scott, QC. Ian Scott, unfortunately, is not here. We have his word that he's not out politicking this afternoon, but that he was called to the Supreme Court of Canada, and he has sent, fortunately, an eminent pinch hitter, Mr. Alec Ryder, QC, of Ian's firm, and Alec will now deliver Ian's lecture on employment relations remedies. Mr. Alec Ryder. Thank you very much. As Marvin has said, the subject of this paper is the recent development in remedies affecting labor relations. It is Ian Scott's paper. It was prepared by him. And I've simply stopped apologizing for Ian and for his absences ever since I was sent over as a student to obtain an adjournment from Judge Dnieper. <laughs> a, a task that we, we, we were obliged to expand our firm so that that task could be handed down to others. Uh, in any event, um, his, uh, his absence is, uh, has nothing to do with the current election campaign. And uh, he, um, although he, he now speaks as a politician, I can say that he's told me that he's in Ottawa on an appeal. So I must ask you to be gracious and accept uh, me as a substitute to deliver his paper. Now, the paper deals with the remedies available under the Federal Act, the Canada Labor Code, and the Ontario Act. But you will see as the paper progresses that the emphasis is placed on the Ontario Act and in the remedies that are now issuing from the Ontario Labor Relations Board, because that is where the significant development in this field is now taking place. And uh, the paper is divided into three basic sections, and the sections are designed to follow the, the rough sort of chronology that, that divides labor relations. The, the first phase in, in labor relations is the acquisition of bargaining rights, that is the certification stage. So the first part of the paper will deal with the remedies that are available in that, in that process. The second stage is the bargaining process. That is the, the, the portions of the act which are designed to lead to a collective agreement between the parties. And then the third stage that the paper deals with is, is, is that respecting the ongoing regulation of labor relations uh, by arbitration of disputes arising under it, under the collective agreement. Now let me deal with the first stage, that is the, the certification application. And both acts, both the Federal Act and the, and the Ontario Act, have specific remedial provisions which, um, which I will deal with subsequently. But superimposed over all of the three phases in the chronology of labor relations that I've just outlined, especially the first two stages, that is certification and bargaining, the, the, both acts, the Federal Act and the Ontario Act, have set out a list of what it calls, or what they call, unfair labor practices, or a list of protected activities a list of uh, rights and obligations, and these provisions are enforced by a general remedial authority in both acts. In the, in the Federal Act, it's Section 189, and in the Ontario Act, it's Section 79. Now, the, the development of new remedies by the Ontario Board in the last two or three years, and it's a phenomena that only dates for two or three years, was not accompanied by any corresponding changes in the Act. The, the remedial authority in Section 79 of the Ontario Act has remained essentially unchanged for a number of years. But because the powers of the Board, the remedial power of the Ontario Board under Section 79 is so wide, it, that wide power has, has made it possible for the Board's uh, remedial jurisprudence to um, to be as expansive as it, as it has been. And I think the first thing to do is to, is to read to you those portions of Section 79 to help you understand just how wide this authority is. And I'm reading just portions of it. The, 
where the board is satisfied that an employer, a, a, a trade union, person or employee has acted contrary to the act, it shall determine what, if anything, the employer, trade union, person or employee shall do or refrain from doing in respect thereto. And I, I, after giving the board that unlimited, essentially unlimited power, it then goes on to provide, to say that the general power includes and then a series of specific powers, such as reinstatement and compensation for reinstatement, directions and cease and desist orders and matters of that kind. So we begin by a very wide statutory power. And as I say, in recent years, that has been coupled, the last two or three years, that has been coupled by willingness and board decisions to use this power to fashion remedies that, that four years ago just simply were not being granted by the Interior Board. Now, the basis of these decisions that I will be speaking to appears to be a, a firm recognition that the rights under the Act have substance only insofar as they are backed by effective remedies, and that insofar as a remedy for a violation of the Act, insofar as a remedy fails to restore the victim to the position he, she, or it, if you're dealing with a company or a trade union, would have been in were it not for the violation, then it permits the offender to gain some advantage by breaching the Act. And the significance of recent decisions, in my judgment, is that in a case before the board, the inquiry that will take place as to what is the appropriate remedy in any particular case must begin, first of all, by ascertaining what harm has been done by the breach that, that has been found to have taken place. And once you ascertain the harm that has been done, the process then goes on to designing a remedy which most uh, effectively and reasonably uh, redresses that harm. Now, what, what constitutes an appropriate remedy is really only limited by the variety of injuries that a breach of the Labor Relations Act or the Federal Act can cause, either to employees, to unions, or to employers, or to all those protected relationships which the Act deals with, such as the bargaining relationship between the union and the company, or the employment relationship between the company and the employees, or the, the membership relationship, really, between the bargaining unit and the employees in the bargaining unit on the one hand and the union on the other hand. So let me turn now with, from that generalized opening to um, discussion of the specific remedies that are available in the certification stage. Now most of you know that a union's application for certification is governed by and is determined by the percentage of membership support it can establish among the bargaining unit, among the employees in the bargaining unit. So that if, if it Obtain, if it has evidence of membership of over 55%, it is entitled to a certificate without a vote. If its membership is between 45% and 55%, then a vote must be ordered before a certificate can be issued, and the vote must result in a majority of the employees opting for the union. Below 45%, the application is dismissed without a vote, unless uh, a special kind of application called a an application for a pre-hearing vote is made, and in order to, to um, meet the minimum require, requirements to obtain a pre-hearing vote, the union must have at the very least 35 percent, or evidence of 35 percent in, um, in the bargaining unit. Now, the remedy that I wish to speak to is an exception to those, that general framework, and that is provided by Section 7A of the Labor Relations Act, and that enables the union to, to become certified without a vote, even though its, its evidence of membership is less than what is required to sustain a, an application to the board, even though it's less than the 35% that I just spoke of. And the ingredients of Section 7A are threefold. The first is that the employer must have violated the act. The second is that the violation must have must have the effect 
of, of rendering it unlikely that the true wishes of the employees can be ascertained. And thirdly, that there is at least adequate support among the employees for the union in the bargaining unit for the, so that effective collective bargaining can take place. Now, the, the second ingredient, let me see what is the second ingredient. The second ingredient is that the effect of the two wishes of the employees cannot be disclosed or have been uh, prevented from being disclosed because um, of the employer's unlawful conduct. And there are two ways in which employees can demonstrate their, two, their, their desires to join or not to join a trade union. And these two ways occur depending on the stage of the process that we're dealing with. During the organizational stage, the, they demonstrate their desires by either signing a card or not signing a card to join the union, or they can sign a petition opposing the union. So that's the first way in which they demonstrate their wishes. Later on in the proceedings, they sometimes are afforded the opportunity of demonstrating their desires by a representative vote, if that is ordered by the board. The significance of Section 7A now is that it gives a remedy to the union at both stages if the violation of the act by the employer has, take for example in the first stage, has prevented the employees from signing cards or has frightened them away from signing cards. So that even though the documentary membership that a union has been able to gather in an organizing campaign is less than 35%, it can still make an application to the board and say that the reason we have membership evidence that is less than 35%, less than your minimum requirements, is because the employer's activity has, in effect, chilled the campaign and frightened the employees away from signing for us. Uh, there is a decision recently handed down in December of last year, late December of last year, in which the, in dealing with the Skyline Hotel, where at the outset of the organizing campaign, the nine employees who were supporting the campaign were all fired. And um, then there was um, a, a series of other unlawful acts which took place um, in the month of the campaign that the campaign lasted. And the result was that even though the union didn't have enough cards to bring an, an application in the normal way, the board um, certified the union. Um, the effect then of Section 7A in our Act, the Ontario Act, is that it prevents employers from profiting from their illegal conduct, which has had the effect of chilling the organizing drive at the outset or interfering with the wishes of the employees in a vote, if a vote has or may be ordered by the board. The Canada Labour Code, on the other hand, has no comparable remedy. It can order a vote to satisfy itself as to the current desires of the employees at any time, I believe, during the course of its proceedings, but it has no authority to, uh, to remedy a situation where an employer has, has uh, by conduct found to be unlawful, prevented the, um, successfully prevented the union organizing drive at the very beginning. Let me go on then to the second stage in the collective bargaining process, which is that of bargaining for a collective agreement. And the greatest problem at, at this stage of the chronology, the greatest problems in, in, in this area occur where the parties are bargaining for a first collective agreement. Because this is a time when the parties are normally the farthest apart. They have no established contractual basis from which to work, and they have no joint experience as to the workability of many of the provisions or items on the bargaining table. The obligations in Ontario at this stage of the process are imposed by Section 14 of the Act, which requires that the parties must bargain in good faith and make every reasonable effort to make a collective agreement. And the clear objects of this provision are twofold. First of all, it, it reinforces the obligation of the employer to recognize the bargaining agent, the union as the bargaining agent. And secondly, it's designed to foster rational discussion of the, 
of, of the issues and minimize the potential for unnecessary industrial conflict as the expression used very often in board cases. Now the main observation of section 14 that needs to be passed on is that it only regulates the manner in which bargaining occurs. It does not require the parties to reach a contract. The obligation under the section is satisfied if the parties bargain in good faith. If, um, if no collective agreement is reached because the union has placed unreasonable demands on the table or because the employer has um, resisted signing on the basis of uh, legitimate but hard bargaining, then the, um, the obligations under the section are still fulfilled. Now because section 14 does not oblige the parties to agree and only obliges them to bargain, that limits the remedial power of, um, of the board when there has been a breach of the obligation to bargain in good faith. In other words, it can't impose a collective agreement. Now the one minor exception to that is that it, where the parties have in fact clearly reached a collective agreement, but for some reason irrelevant to the process have refused to sign it, then the parties can direct that the, the agreement that they already have reached be signed. But subject to that, the board cannot issue an order which in any way appears to be directing the parties to enter an agreement. The example of what I mean where they can force the parties to sign is a case called the Municipality of Casimir where um, the parties had reached agreement. There was no lack of um, consensus with respect to the terms of their collective agreement that they derived at, but the employer refused to sign on the assumption that to do so would have prejudiced a judicial review application that was then outstanding. And um, arbitrators have held that uh, collective agreements must be signed before they become binding. So the company's, so the refusal of the company was of some consequence to the, um, to the union and to the relationship. The union then filed a complaint under section 79 of the act alleging that section 14 had been breached and um, it was successful and the board directed the parties to sign the agreement. But apart from those very special circumstances, the board will not order the parties to agree and will not dictate the terms of the agreement. Um, that's to be contrasted with the, the Federal Act, which has a section which does permit in a first collective agreement situation, it permits the board to, to impose uh, terms of the first collective agreement on the parties, and that's section 171. And that power was introduced in the 1977-78 amendments to the act, and not long after that introduction, the, um, the board had a case before it in which it did exercise that power and set out some principles in the process. The case is the is CJMS Radio Montreal. It's a 1979 decision of the, of the federal board. And the principles, there's a number of them, and, they, and I'll deal with them each in turn, are as follows. First of all, the basic purposes of the code is to encourage collective bargaining. And that means that the intervention of the federal board under section 171 will be the exception, not the rule. Secondly, section 171 does not reduce the obligation to bargain in good faith. And that where good faith bargaining has taken place by both sides, and yet a deadlock has been reached, then the normal traditional means of resolving the deadlock, that is strike and lockout, will prevail. The board will not come in and prevent a strike or lockout by exercising its powers under section 171. Thirdly, the remedy is essentially only available where the real stumbling block in the process is, is that one or perhaps both of the parties have exhibited a true distaste for the process of collective bargaining and its, and its responsibilities. And, and it seems to me that the basis of the CJMS decision really is 
at, at heart that the fact that both parties had abdicated their bargaining responsibilities. Now, once, fourthly, once the board decides to impose a collective agreement, it doesn't necessarily proceed on the basis of a normal interest arbitration as we have come to know it. In other words, it doesn't consider itself to be engaged in the process of compulsory arbitration of collective agreements. What it does, rather, is leave to itself the right to impose or to expose the parties to the possibility of imposing terms and conditions that neither party foresaw with the stated objective of generating a, quote, healthy fear of board intervention. So they have stated their policies as being openly designed to lead the parties to the conclusion that dealing with each other across the bargaining table may be preferable than going to the labor board and seeking a remedy under section 171. Now, before leaving the negotiation stage, in the stage which is designed to result in a collective agreement, I should point out two recent amendments to the Ontario Act, which became effective on June 17th of last year. The first is section, and I'll just touch on these briefly, the first is section 34E, which permits the employer to require the Minister of Labor to conduct a vote of all members in the bargaining unit on the last offer submitted by the employer during the negotiation process or the most recent offer, that is, before the application is made to the minister. This is a request that can only be made to the minister once during every session of, um, of, of collective bargaining. And where the offer and, and the, the application is simply made by sending a letter to the minister, there's no special form in the act or the regulations that has to be complied with. A simple letter will do. The minister will then uh, uh, send the issue over to a labor relations officer working for the Ontario Labor Relations Board who will convene a meeting of the parties to make the arrangements for the vote. Now, where the offer is accepted, the Ontario Board has determined that the parties then become bound by the accepted offer and um, they are obliged, the parties are obliged to execute a collective agreement. On the other hand, where the where the parties, um, where the, the employees reject the offer, then the, the parties must return to their obligations to bargain in good faith. The, the second amendment is set out in section 36A1 of the act, and that deals with the question of union security. And it provides that except in the construction industry, a certified union, trade union, during bargaining, can request that the RAN formula be incorporated into the collective agreement. And when that request is made, the employer must agree to it. And the effect of that provision really is to remove the question of union security and the compulsory checkoff of dues. It removes that as a bargainable issue, it takes it off the bargaining table. And in, in one recent case where um, that was the only issue outstanding between the parties, um, at the time the amendment was passed, um, so that when the amendment was passed, at the moment the amendment was passed, there was no issue outstanding between the parties. Then the employer raised an additional uh, um, bargainable item, and that was found to be an act of bargaining in bad, in bad faith. The, um, that leads me to the really the most important area of uh, respecting developments of remedies in labor relations, and that is the remedies for unfair labor practices. That is, remedies for those violations of the series of rights and duties and protected activities that are established in both the Federal Act and the Ontario Act. As I say, the Ontario Act provision, giving this general remedial authority for these violations is Section 79. And the best indication of the Ontario Board's intention to exercise this statutory authority to a more full, uh, to a fuller extent, is set out in the Radio Shack decision, which is a 1979 decision of the Ontario Board in a case uh, between the steelworkers on the one hand and Radio Shack on the other hand. And um, 
this intention is particularly shown in a, in a long passage uh, by the current chairman of the board, who seems to be the spearhead of most of these remedial developments that are taking place across the street. And uh, I think it's sufficiently important if I read it in full. It is trite to say, I'm quoting now, it is trite to say that all rights acquire substance only insofar as they are backed by effective remedies. Labor law presents no exception to this proposition. An administrative tribunal with a substantial volume of litigation before it faces a great temptation to develop boilerplate remedies which are easy to apply and administer in all cases. This temptation must be resisted if effective remedies are to buttress important statutory rights. An important strength of administrative tribunals is their sensitivity to the real forces at play beneath the legal issues brought before them. And there is no greater challenge to the application of this expertise than in, than in the area of developing remedies. To be effective, remedies should be equitable. They should take account of the economics and psychology permeating the situation at issue. And they should attempt to take into account the reasons for the statutory violations. Remedies should also be sensitive to the interests of innocent bystanders. This means then that the board should try and tailor remedies to each particular case. Now having said that, the Radio Shack decision continues on to reach three basic principles that underpin, in the board's view, the remedial authority it has under Section 79. The first principle is that a remedy is not a penalty. It, it, it may have a deterrent effect, but its primary purpose remains um, that to remedy the victim, to place the victim, uh, the, the, the victim of the breach in the same position he, she, or it would have been in had there been no breach in the first place. The purpose is not to punish, in other words. Secondly, that monetary relief is, is compensatory, uh, compensatory in nature. And thirdly, that a collective agreement cannot be imposed. And I've dealt with this last one. Now, with these principles in mind, I, I propose to deal with the various types of remedies that the board is presently uh, ordering. First of all, dealing with the question of damages and compensation. Under Section 94, there is Section 94, no, sorry, Section 97, subparagraph 4, paragraph C, there is a specific authority to order the payment of compensation for lost wages of employees who were dismissed. And that is a normal and longstanding remedy and, and uh, has represented the practice of the board for many years. In addition to that, however, the board is now awarding damages under the general language of Section 79 for reasons not specifically provided for. For example, in the Radio Shack case, damages were awarded for the economic loss to employees caused by the loss of opportunity to negotiate a collective agreement. In other words, had the unfair labor practices not taken place, it is possible that a collective agreement would have been reached sooner than it was. And that had some economic impact on the employees. And the result was that damages were awarded to the employees for that economic, economic impact. Secondly, damages were, were awarded in that case to adjust for the union's additional expenses attributable to the improper conduct of the employer. The additional expenses of, that it incurred in organizing and the additional expenses that occurred in, in negotiations. In, in a recent, as yet unreported, decision involving Kmart, it was issued in January of this year, damages were awarded to two employees in the amount of $500 each who were subject to a peculiar form of harassment. I think that whenever they went to the washroom, they were accompanied. And um, I should, there's a note to that case. That particular order in the Kmart decision has been re uh, rescinded by the board pending further submissions. I think the board was worried about the fact that that order was issued without the subject being addressed during argument. And um, so that argument could be addressed before it uh, exercised whatever remedial authority it had in that area. It rescinded its order and requested that the parties submit further argument on it. 
Um, a third case is, is an older one, the Academy of Medicine case, a 1977 decision of the board, where the employer shut down uh, in the face of, um, um, of a certification application bought by an employer, bought, bought by a union. And in that case, the employees themselves were awarded damages calculated on a, on a reasonable period in which to obtain alternate employment. The union itself was awarded damages to cover its, its uh, organizing and bargaining expenses that were thrown away as a result of the shutdown. And in addition, the union had, was awarded cost, legal cost, in the application under Section 79. And that is the only case that I know of where the board has awarded costs. It's extremely reluctant to do so. And I think mainly on the theory that in labor relations matters, under the Labor Relations Act, um, um, in theory, in any, in any event, these proceedings should be available to lawyers and non-lawyers alike, should be available to personnel officers of employers and, uh, and trade union officials. On the other hand, and that um, it does not want to discourage uh, uh, their participation in the proceedings, which might, which might occur if, if costs were awarded to the successful litigant. Also in that case, because there was no further possibility of a bargaining relationship, uh, the board thought that this, if ever, was an appropriate case for awarding costs and for compensating the the um, union for the legal expenses that were made necessary by the employer's conduct. Before leaving damages, I should deal with the question of interest. The Ontario Board now regularly awards interest on compensation for lost wages. It's the only basis on which interest is awarded uh, when damages are handed out by the, or awarded by the Ontario Board. I believe that the Ontario Board is the only Labor Relations Board in Canada to award interest so far. The formula for doing so is, is set out for calculating the interest, set out in a decision called Hallowell House Limited, a 1980 decision of the board. It's a reasonably complicated formula, and it's not necessary for council to understand it. It suffices just to say to the board, we would like interest in accordance with the board's current jurisprudence, and they know what is meant by that. Um, the, the next, um, and as a result of that, uh, we are finding that in labor arbitration cases, arbitrators are now beginning to award interest whereas they hadn't done so before. But I'll come to that when I deal with, uh, with uh, the arbitration process. The, the next type of order that I want to deal with are those which give the union access to the company's premises in the attempt to redress some, some the, the consequences of some violation that the employer has committed. And these orders are, are given in, essentially, as I say, where the board concludes that the employer's conduct has tended to improperly reduce the support for employees for the trade union or has somehow rendered the legitimacy of union activity, of lawful union activity, reduced that legitimacy in the eyes of the employees. And there are two types of access orders which, which are, are now being issued to redress this problem. The first is uh, orders requiring the employer to conduct meetings um, on company premises during working hours to permit the union to go on the premises and conduct these meetings. In the Skyline case, for example, one of the unfair labor activities uh, that was committed by the Skyline Hotel during the organizing campaign was that they, they permitted no activity whatever on premises by the, the applying union. They did, however, permit extensive activity on the part of a, of a house committee that was um, established, perhaps not by the skyline, but was established by employees in response to the, the application or the organizing drive. And the um, House Committee was allowed to have meetings in the ballroom of the hotel. And in the result, 
the skyline order of the, of the board said that the union was allowed to conduct two meetings of up to three hours length per meeting during working hours at the hotel in the ballroom, in the very place where the hotel committee had formerly held its meetings, so that it could explain to the employees, so that essentially that the union could show the flag on the hotel premises, explain to the employees what rights they had, and um, somehow attempt to legitimize the union activities, the normal union activities. Um, another form of access is the requirement to post notices on company bulletin boards. And these can be notices of ordinary union meetings, and also sometimes now they are notices that have been issued by the board in order to clarify the um, rights of employees that may have been offended uh, by proceedings leading up to these orders. So that in the, um, in the Skyline case, in the Radio Shack case, and in other cases, uh, the board has drafted up uh, reasonably direct notices declaring to the employees what rights they have, that these rights are being violated, and giving promises that they won't be violated again. And the employer is obliged to post these notices so that uh, all can read them. The third type of remedy, um, and perhaps the most powerful and useful to the board, is the power to issue directions. And this is the, the mainstay remedial authority that the board uses to regulate the operation of labor relations within its jurisdiction. And what constitutes an appropriate direction depends and can vary on the factual circumstances of each case. And I've brought five here just to illustrate the kind of remedy or the kind of direction that is being issued by the board. The first is a, a cease and desist order uh, where specific unlawful conduct is, um, is identified in the proceedings. A second is um, a direction, for example, where uh, the union has failed to fairly represent an employee and as a result the employee has lost his rights to take a matter to arbitration, the board will direct that the, that the union take the matter to arbitration at the union's expense. A third is where there's been um, a discriminatory refusal by the union to register an employee in accordance with the union's hiring hall rules. And in cases of that kind, the federal board, and I'm sure if it came up, the Ontario board would order that the complainant be registered at the top of the list so that, um, so that he can take uh, advantage of the next possible re referral. And he will, uh, the, the union will also be directed to pay compensation for the loss suffered by the failure to refer him to work in the past. Um, a fourth is where the employer uh, had relocated um, outside of the scope of the, um, outside of the ambit of the scope clause in the collective agreement or in the certificate of the board. Uh, in cases of that kind, the employer will, will be ordered, in the case of that kind, the employer has in, in one case, in the Westinghouse case in Ontario, was ordered to um, offer employment to all those employees who wanted to relocate in the new area and uh, to maintain their present level of wages and benefits and seniority, and even to reimburse the relocated employees for all reasonable transportation, moving, and commuting or temporary housing costs in connection with the relocation for a specified period. So that, if anything, gives an example of the far, of the reach that the Ontario Board is now, um, uh, is now extending um, its remedial powers. And fifthly, where a union has, um, um, has, has breached uh, its duty of fair referral, uh, it has been ordered, the union has been ordered to prepare a, a set of rules um, so that if these rules are followed, fair referral can take place and the board has retained jurisdiction over the matter to see that this has properly been done. Now, that completes what, I, what the paper 
um, has to say with respect to the, um, the remedial authorities, um, the, the remedial powers uh, that are being now exercised by the Interior Board, it, um, it, it is not intended that the paper is an exhaustive, uh, provides an exhaustive list of all the uh, powers that the Interior Board is now exercising but it does give an indication of the variety of remedial sponsors that is now, uh, that is now taking place. That leads the paper to the, the third area in the chronology of, of labor relation matters, and that is the remedies that are um, awarded by arbitrations who are obliged to resolve disputes under the collective agreements, under collective agreements by the process of arbitration. And, the, and here, the, the, the development that has, that has taken place in, um, under, the, under the statutory, to, under, under the Labor Relations Board has not, has not been experienced in the, in the arbitration process. For 15 years or more, arbitrators have, um, that is since the Polymer decision, when, when Mr. Justice Laskin was an arbitrator, and decided in the Polymer case that damages can be awarded against a union for, an, for a strike in violation of the collective agreement. Ever since that case, arbitrators have with some confidence fashioned a variety of remedies for violations of the collective agreement. And when they do so, they have been prepared to depart from the traditional contract doctrine dealing with remedies. For example, the, the classical contract rule um, where there has been unlawful dismissal, limits the remedy to damages. Um, but in, in, in labor arbitration, and, and of course in, uh, under the common law where an employee has been dismissed without proper notice, um, he cannot obtain specific performance for that violation. Yet under collective agreements, employers and unions have traditionally been exposed to the remedy where reinstatement takes place and um, in discharge and suspension cases or what they call in-kind remedies in cases of lost incentive earnings or missed overtime opportunities take place. And similarly, arbitrators have, have ignored the, the rules of privity of contract and award damages to non to non-union members who are employees because although they may be covered by the collective agreement, they are strictly speaking not parties to that agreement. So in the strict sense, there is not much to say with respect to what is happening in terms of remedies in the arbitral field, but there is a development that, uh, that may impact on remedies that is now taking place. And it fundamentally is a contest between two basic differing approaches to the functions of arbitration. On the one side, we have the traditional approach, and the leading case for that approach, of course, is that is the decision in the Supreme Court of Canada in 1968 in the Port, Har Port Arthur shipbuilding case. And the principles developed from that case, or confirmed in that case, are, first of all, that the boards, boards of arbitration have no inherent remedial power, that their function is merely to interpret the collective agreement and apply it where they find that there's been a violation of the collective agreement. They, their right to provide a remedy, therefore, under this traditional approach depends on there being a finding that the collective agreement has been violated. And the collective agreement, when I say the collective agreement and I speak of the traditional approach, I mean the collective agreement as it is written. They don't have any power to amend it or to alter it, or to prevent an employee from, uh, to prevent a union or an employer from, um, from asserting its clear rights under the agreement. In other words, the, it flows from this traditional approach that the doctrine of promissory estoppel is not a doctrine that is available to, um, to an arbitrator. And the, the power to rectify uh, for clerical errors in the agreement is not a power that is available um, to an arbitrator. The, with respect to um, whether an, um, an arbitrator can, can um, 
use the, the technique or the, the tool of um, promissory estoppel, that matter was determined in a, in, by our Ontario Divisional Court in the Sarnia General Hospital case in 1973. And it held, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that it was Mr. Justice Osler who, um, who as you know, um, um, as a practicing lawyer, devoted his life to uh, uh, the labor relations field. It held that if the language in the agreement was unambiguous, the invocation of the doctrine of estoppel was tantamount to a modification of the agreement that the parties had made and therefore was outside the scope of the arbitrator's authority. So that is the traditional approach which confines the arbitrator's jurisdiction to, to interpreting and then applying the contract. And this approach has to be contrasted with a new and perhaps uh, what can be characterized as an underground movement um, that is shown, that takes a broader view of, of, of the function of an arbitrator and will permit the arbitrator to adjudicate the dispute that has arisen in the fullest sense, in the sense that a court can do. And if, if full adjudication requires the use of the doctrine of promissory estoppel, then this approach would require that the arbitrators use it. And if this approach requires the use of the duty of fairness, which we've seen growing in Ontario courts, then that, that tool is, um, is available to the arbitrator as well. Now examples of this approach are found in a number of, of uh, reported decisions by arbitrators. The first is the, uh, the Edwards of Canada case, which interesting enough was decided by the current chairman of the Ontario Labor Relations Board when he was sitting as an arbitrator. And he, he was plain to say that the, the, the court in the Sarnia case had misconceived the nature of labor arbitration insofar as that court dealt with the remedial authority of arbitrations boards. The arbitrator here placed his reliance on Section 37 of the Act. And it's really a, this, this contest between the traditional dispute on the one hand and, the, um, and this underground approach, the traditional approach on the one hand and the underground approach on the other hand, is really um, depends on what emphasis you place on Section 37 of the Labor Relations Act. The underground approach places great emphasis on the Labor Relations Act, Section 37, which requires that all disputes which arise between the parties under a collective agreement have to be resolved by, uh, in a final and binding way, by arbitration. On the other hand, the, the traditional approach uh, places its reliance on the provisions in the collective agreement which say that the arbitrator's jurisdiction is limited to interpreting and applying the collective agreement and that he is not entitled to amend or alter or modify the agreement in any way. In the Edwards case, the arbitrator said that Section 37 compelled the arbitrator to override the provisions in the collective agreement which confine the the uh, attempt to limit the uh, remedial powers of the arbitrator, and that Section 37 requires the board to cope with representations and conduct that have occurred on the plant floor that are inconsistent with the collective agreement language. And, if, and the means of doing so, of course, is the use of the doctrine of estoppel. And there's a, there's a second example I in the British Columbia case which is equally pointed on the, in the subject. It's the case um, called the Corporation of the City of Penticton. And in that case, I think it was Professor Wyler who decided it, he said, at the outset, this board wants to make it crystal clear that arbitrators in this province definitely do have remedial authority under the Labor Code to apply the equitable doctrine of estoppel in order to provide a final finding and sensible settlement of grievances under a collective agreement. And there is a, a more recent case issued as recently as last month where the, the doctrine of promissory estoppel was taken a step further. As you know, 
We've always understood that the doctrine can only be used as a shield and not as a sword, it, um, and that um, that distinction is, is, is critical in labor relations, of course, because unions are generally the ones that are grieving, and so generally speaking, the unions cannot rely on that doctrine. And the result of that phenomena, the the chairman of this case, in a recent case called CNCP Telecommunications, it's not reported in any in any journal yet, but it um, no doubt will be. It held that that distinction between the sword and the shield no longer has any application in labor relations or in the arbitrable field, and um, it permitted the union to raise it as a sword. Now. That view has, has got some support in academic writings and has had that support for some time, but needless to say, it has no, there's been no judicial statement which supports it uh, to the present moment. The duty of fairness, however, and in many aspects, the duty of fairness is a lot like the, the, um, the rules of promissory estoppel. It can have similar um, ingredients. It has received judicial um, judicial approval for its application to labor relations, to, to the decisions of, our, of arbitrators under collective agreements. There are two cases which decide this point. The first is the Ontario Divisional Court's decision in the Municipality of Metropolitan Toronto and the Civic Employees Union. Am I running out of time? All right, I am finished. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm on my last, on the last, on the last item. It's probably, um, it's the only development of any interest that is taking place in, uh, in the arbitration field, so let me deal with it shortly. Um, that was a case, uh, that was a case where, where they imposed, where the arbitrator decided in favor of the grievor in a case where there was no breach of the collective agreement. It was in distinct uh, opposition to the Port Arthur shipbuilding case. Notwithstanding that, and they did so on the basis that the employer, while he may not have breached the collective agreement, he did breach his duty of fairness. And that decision was upheld by the divisional court um, in a 1977 decision. And since then, the issue was again decided, and. In, in the case of Falkenbridge Nickel Mines and Bruner number two, that's everybody's friend John Bruner, who was the arbitrator in that case, he applied the doctrine of, 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 of fairness to the duty of an employer, um, as part of the duty of an employer in, in, uh, in dealing with um, employees. The employer had not breached the collective agreement, notwithstanding the absence of the breach of the collective agreement, he did breach the duty of fairness and the the divisional court upheld the decision. And one word on this, I'll just give you Mr. Justice Griffith's decision. He said that, um, he referred to the Metropolitan Toronto case and he says, it stands at this, time, at this time as the final word on the subject. This court has decided that there is a duty on an employer to exercise its managerial functions to demote under collective agreements, to be fair to the employee, et cetera, et cetera. So notwithstanding the absence of a breach in the collective agreement, um, a remedy can be obtained if the duty of fairness has been violated. The point to be made in this area, however, is that the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada have not spoken on this issue so that the last word remains to be given. Thank you very much.